everyone and welcome back to my channel Tomcat Stitchery. Today we've got an exciting first sitting on a dog um, which you can't really see. Sorry. Gidget is here right here beside me. You guys aren't going to believe that she's actually real because she's like passed out every time I'm, I'm filming. She's real I promise. She's I'm just kind of sitting on her. Okay today we've got an exciting first. Um, we have the first Tomcat Stitchery so long. Woo. <laughs> Um, so again, this is my first time to do one of these. I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants a little bit on this. Um, but I thought today would be an excellent time to talk about fabric, notions, collecting everything for your, um, blazer. Again, we are doing Butterick 6641. Hopefully you can see that. Um, which is a Lisette pattern for Butterick, and it is a blazer. And it has the cool, um notched collar so it doesn't have your typical lapel there's a, a term for that like a faux lapel I don't know there's a, a term I've heard for that but you know it doesn't have a collar it looks like the collar is popped but it's not really there's just not a collar on it but it does have the notched um like a like if a lapel collar were kind of turned up a little bit um anyway it is semi-fitted, it is lined, it has the notch stand collar, it has a single button closure on the front, side front and side back seams, uh, two-piece sleeve, front pockets with the flap, and a back vent. So this will be all fun stuff to go through. Um, you know, how to line, we'll talk about how to line a vent. Um, well, I'll get into that in a second. There are also several pattern pieces included for the different cup sizes. So there is an AB cup, um, and usually it's the side panel that's a different one. So a B, a C cup, or a D cup. Now, how to figure that, we will talk about in just a second. I'm not really going to go over fitting with this pattern, because um, I really just want this to kind of be a sew along, but I will briefly talk about how to pick, um, that's kind of why I picked this pattern, because you can get a, sorry, I have a hair, right? I also probably shouldn't be wearing my glasses, because I notice I get glare. Sorry, I wear glasses 90% of the time. <laughs> Just not when I'm filming because I get the glare from the lights. Okay, um, anyway, but I want this to be more of a sewing video. And I am, again, going to film some separate little tutorials as we go through here. So for this one, I will probably have a, um, well, pocket with a flap tutorial. I will have a how to line a vent tutorial. And then also bagging a lining tutorial. And I think that will kind of cover cover some good ones. Um, there's also buttons on the two-piece sleeve, and I don't know if there's a, probably most of the time with, with jackets it's like a faux vent, because no one really unbuttons those, um, but we'll see as we get into the pattern a little bit. So anyway, on the back of the pattern, let's talk about sizing real quick, and then we'll talk about supplies. So again, this one has different cup sizes for um, A, B cup, a C cup, and a D cup, and it's a princess line seam, so usually it's a different side piece. The piece that's right here will be different. Although the front too. Sometimes with the front it'll just be a lengthening thing so you'll have to cut a longer piece for a D for instance versus an A or B because you need that extra length. I love these patterns. It, I don't have to do a full bust adjustment. It takes um, so much guesswork out of fitting and probably the only thing I'm not even going to make a 12 for this. I like to live on the edge. <laughs> but you can totally do though and I actually do recommend you should do a 12. Um, if you have any questions about fit, if you're new to fit, I have just sewn enough of the big four patterns that I know exactly what kind of alterations I need to do for myself. Uh, and probably, I'm going to probably have to take the shoulder in at least an inch because of my narrow shoulders, um, which I've done a tutorial on narrow shoulder adjustments before. Um, but I'll just take a, an inch in off the shoulder and then I will probably have to shorten the sleeve by a little bit. And I sew a size 14 with a decap. Now the way I like to figure this, I always pick with my big four patterns, I pick my size based on my upper bust. So um, for instance, a size 14 is a 36 inch bust. I don't have a 36 inch bust, but my upper bust is 36 and a half. And I always go down because there's always, there's just a lot of ease in big four patterns. Now, before you sew anything, so that's how I pick this. Also the waist for a 14 is a 28. I also do not have a 28 inch waist. Um, and hips are 38, which actually is my hip measurement. I do have a 38 inch hip. Um, but this jacket, it kind of stops mid-hip, I would say. So, I mean, your hip measurement's not really 
um, need to be taken into account. And really not your waist either, because it's not super fitted through the waist. So I'm not going to worry about that. So what I will do, and um, I mean, I know a 14 D cup fits me because that's uh, what I always, <laughs> what I always sew in these. But they will have on the patterns, there will be a little circle with a cross through it. And there'll be one, and you have to kind of look through the pieces to find where it is. But there'll be one at the bust, and it'll be a bust measurement. And it will list all the finished measurement sizes for that multi-size pattern. And then you'll look through pieces and you'll find a waist marking. Um, unless the waist isn't important. You know, if it's like real loose fitting, sometimes there won't be a waist measurement or a hip measurement. But those, the little circle with the cross through it on big four patterns is where they usually have, um, a lot of times it's the apex, or it'll show you where the waistline is or where the hip line is if you need to make alterations there. And a lot of times they will have the finished measurements there. So that is what I go off of. Now, you can look at finished measurements and a lot of times have questions about, okay, how much ease do I need? Because clearly you don't want to sew a garment in a woven, it's like a blazer that has the same finished bust measurement as your body because you won't have room to move. I typically don't, I always make sure I have at least two inches in ease at my bust one inch at my waist and at least two inches at my hips. Those are just go-tos if something is super fitted. Now for a blazer that I'm going to be wearing over things, I'm probably going to want, oh, two to three inches um, of ease. I don't need a ton of ease in my bust because um, I do, I don't like it to be too unfitted. I like everything to kind of hug me up here a little tighter, even if it's looser fitting, uh, just because otherwise I get balloony looking, I feel like, when things hang off my bust too much. Um, but again, this is semi-fitted, so I don't think the waist is going to be an issue at all, um, or the hips. And for reference, my waist is 33 inches. Last time I measured um, is 33 inches, so I'm a good 5 inches away from <laughs> the waist measurement on this pattern, but I don't think it's going to be an issue. So that's how I pick patterns, and that's my suggestion. Look at those finished uh, measurements, and then you can make adjustments um, on there. Because it could be that even with the D-cup, for whatever size you're choosing, that you still need to do a full bust adjustment, and that's fine. And I've had to do that before as well when my bust was larger, and it just makes it easier. You just don't have to do as big of a full bust adjustment. So that's all I have to say about the size and the fitting on this pattern. So going forward, I'm assuming, again, I haven't opened this up yet, but I'm assuming that there are a bajillion pattern pieces in here. Um, but as I actually get to sewing, you know, I will have you guys along with me the whole time. So we will talk about that as we hit it. Hit it. Um, and then again, I'm going to have separate videos for those three tutorials I talked about. The pocket with the flap, a lining, a bagged lining, um, and then also lining event. So I will have three separate videos that I will refer you to as we're sewing along, and then those will be separate. So for future reference, if we're making, you're making a different pattern and you just want to reference back to those techniques, you'll be able just to go to the tutorials playlist on my channel and um, access those super easily without having to go through an entire sew along. So that's the plan. Okay, let's talk about fabric. So on the back, the fabrics that are recommended are cotton blends, gabardine, wool blends, linen, and brocade. So I want to talk about some of those options and I'll show you what I have picked for mine. So we'll talk about this first. Okay, wool blends. This is a wool coating. And a lot of times on websites or even at the fabric store, you'll see where it says wool coating. It's thick. So, you know, it doesn't have like a ton of drape. Like this is what you would make like a wool pea coat out of, for instance. This is a, a wool blend. This isn't completely wool. I got it when Hancock's was going out of sale. Um, but it's a melton wool, which is heavier and it does have a nap, which means you can tell it has a little bit of a brushed surface. So all of my pattern pieces would need to be facing the same way if I were going to use this for the blazer um, because it does have a nap. Now with a fabric like this, you can get away with just probably the interfacing that they talk about, which we'll talk more about interfacings here in a second. You wouldn't need to underline this at all. And I'll talk about that in a little bit um, when I get to this next one. So this one, you don't need an underlining. You could just sew this up, interface it, um, line it per normal, be good to go. And interfacing as in interfacing the pieces that it tells you to interface in the pattern. Okay, so that's one option that you could do the blazer very easily. Make a little bit of a warmer blazer, but great for the winter and fall and that kind of thing. Or even if you have chillier springs, which we actually tend to do here. Okay, another option would be a wool crepe. And... 
looking at this, although it's kind of hard to tell, there's a lot of time. A lot of blazers are made out of a wool crepe. So wool crepe, or crepe period, has kind of a texture to it. Let's see if that'll focus. There we go. You can kind of see a little bit of a texture because it twists the um, fiber when it's being woven. So this is a wool crepe, and this is actually a wool nylon blend, um, which gives a little bit of dirt. I just blinded myself with my studio lights, too. <laughs> I looked into the light. I shouldn't have looked into the light. Um, so this stuff is very drapey. This is actually the fabric I made my Camille trousers out of, my Sew Over Camille trousers. So as you can tell, this is super drapey, which you may think wouldn't make the best tailored jacket. We're going to talk about tailoring here in a minute, too, but I'll get to that in a second. So my response to that would be underlining. Now, underlining is typically where you take another fabric and you mount it to the back of the fashion fabric and you sew them together as one. So it's different than aligning. Um, so they become one piece. Now, um, this can be used in a, a lot of different applications. If you want something um, with a little more structure, you can underline. Um, in different pieces maybe you want to underline. When I made my big ball skirt for the so frosting that I wore to my cousin's wedding, um, I underlined that with cotton just to give that taffeta a little bit more structure and to help keep it from um, creasing as badly. So that's another thing. You can, and typically underline is a very lightweight fabric, so it might be like a muslin or a batiste, cotton batiste, cotton lawn, um, things like that to help just give cotton or a silk organza a lot of times is used for interlining uh, or underlining to um, just help stable, stabilize the fabric as a whole. And typically when you're underlining fabric, you want to underline all your pieces the same because then it will give the same hand to all of the fabric. So that being said, that's one way you can do it. We're going to talk about tailoring here right now. There are different ways to tailor. <laughs> um, I have made a traditionally tailored jacket um, with the pad stitching, all the hand pad stitching, all the hair canvases, um, the whole nine yards. A felt under collar. Um, I can show you that jacket actually sometime if you were interested. I actually drafted the pattern myself completely from my sloper. Um, the whole nine yards. And it was, I'm glad I did it. It was a fantastic experience, but I am just, that is not the type of seamstress I am. I'm just, while I can find um, joy in doing slow projects on occasion, 90% of the time I like, not, not instant results, but I am, I just move at a little bit faster speed. And that could be some of my personality. And it could also be that I worked in garment construction um, where I, ha I couldn't be slow, like I had, I had to be fast, uh, just because time is money and all of that. Uh, so I don't know, maybe a combination of that. However, um, there are great fusible interfacings on the market today, <laughs> and they're fantastic, and I use those about 90% of the time. I don't use sew-in interfacings hardly at all. Um, maybe if I were working with a silk chiffon or, um, something along the, or even a real lightweight silk georgette or something where I didn't want the um where even the chance of glue like coming through the fabric would be high then I would use maybe a silk organza sew-in interfacing but for the most part I use fusibles for most things so in anything like this um I would underline all of my fabric with lightweight interfacing and I'm going to talk about that in just a second um, when we get to our interfacings but a lightweight, um, oh, I actually really like a lightweight, like, Trico or Knit, um, light, light, uh, interfacing, <laughs> sorry. And I use that for almost, just because I tend to sew with, like, softer fabrics and that kind of thing, um, I use a lightweight Knit Trico interfacing for almost all of my interfacings. Now, I do, will carry a weft interfacing I'll usually have on hand, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about that again for tailoring purposes and heavier weight. And then I also like a um, crisper things for like shirt collars and that kind of stuff. If I'm doing like a cotton shirt, especially if I'm making stuff for my husband where I need a little bit um, heavier duty um, shirt interfacing for a placket and collar and stuff for like a cotton shirt. Those are really the three interfacings that I use. I'm going to talk about two of them. Um, I won't talk about the shirt interfacing because we're not using that for this project, but I will talk about the other two here in more detail in just a second. But I would, again, and I don't block fuse. I just find it, 
I don't know, a little bit wasteful. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's easier to block views, which is where you just take your yardage and you put it on top of the yardage of interfacing and you just block it all together at once and then you cut out your pieces, which might be a little more time efficient. What I typically do is cut out all my pieces in fabric, lay them on top of the interfacing, um, just each piece out so I'm not cutting anything on the fold with the interfacing, and then I'll just cut around and fuse as I go. Um, but for a crepe, and also for what I'm going to use, I would definitely do that with a lightweight knit fusible interfacing, and I will show you that in a second, um, but I would do the whole jacket in that, and it'll give it just a little bit more structure as you're working with it for this type of project. So yeah, wool crepe is an option. Okay, another one that you might be interested in is a wool suiting. Now this is a lighter weight, um, and I honestly, I don't even know what's in this. I bought this at SR Harris, um, which is a dreamy fabric warehouse in Minneapolis that I'm just dreaming of getting back to and it's it's fantastic if you're ever in the Minneapolis area or anywhere near it it is so worth the trip <laughs> um, but I bought this there and so I'm not entirely sure what's in it I was kind of like in a fabric frenzy when I was buying it um, it's definitely a worsted wool which means it's woven super tight so it doesn't wrinkle which is men's suiting. If you'll notice, like men's jackets and pants a lot of time are real. They'll be lightweight, but they'll be, um, they don't wrinkle uh, because, you know, you want to look put together. I mean, you really have to crunch things up to get them to wrinkle. But this would be great for a blazer. And again, it's lightweight, and so I would totally fuse interfacing to the back of this as well, just to give it a little um, more body because it's pretty, I'm not even showing this to you in the camera, am I? Because um, it's, it's pretty lightweight. So again, this is just a gorgeous wool. God, this makes you want to make a blazer out of this too. <laughs> but yeah, just like your traditional like plaids. Um, now you're doing a princess seam. You want to think about with your plaids, you're doing a princess seam um, front. And so you're going to have issues with plaid placement. So if that bothers you, you may not want to use a plaid because there's going to be a whole lot of like matching that's going to have to go on in order to and they won't match up perfectly because you do so much easing across the bust. Um, keep that in mind. Okay, other things that they suggested. So that's kind of your gabardines or kind of along the same line as like the worsted, like suiting. That a lot of times will be called suiting fabric um, online. Uh, we talked about some wool blends. So now I'm going to talk about some linen. Okay, not all linens are created equal. You're going to want a heavier weight linen for a jacket. So this is, I'm going to leave a link down to um, Fabric Store's Heavyweight Linen. It is phenomenal. It would make a great jacket. Um, it is not, you can't see through it. Um, it's light and crisp. Again, a lightweight fusible interfacing on the back will help this from wrinkling horribly when you wear it. Uh, just that added to the back of it. And we'll give it just a little bit more structure. So I have two... This is a heavyweight, and this is like a midweight, but I think this would still work for a jacket as long as it was interfaced properly um, on the back. So, like, I can't really see through it. <laughs> but you just want to be careful. Some linens are for blouses, and they're lighter weight, and that's not going to work for a jacket. Um, so I would say a midweight, um, and I bought this at a fabric store a long time ago, uh, so I don't even know technically what they called this, but this is like a medium weight. You can kind of tell by feeling, but it's not as heavy as this. And this is the heavyweight linen from the fabric store. I'm going to make myself a pair of shorts out of this. Um, but I will leave a link to their heavyweight linens because any of those would be fantastic. And a linen jacket, if you are in the Northern Hemisphere and going into spring and summer, a linen blazer would be dreamy. And now that we're talking about it, I kind of want to make one of them in this as well. <laughs> so yeah, linen is definitely a good option. But I would definitely, mostly for the wrinkle factor on that, I would definitely um, just, and not so much, I don't mind crumpled linen. I kind of like crumpled linen. That's the whole look of linen. Um, but it just helps with, like, the deep creases that you can get from, like, sitting and that kind of thing. Interfacing that would, would solve most of that. Okay, and then the other thing, they mentioned brocades, um, which you could totally use. I don't have any brocades on hand right now, otherwise I would show you. But it also mentioned cotton blends. I have here with me, this is what I'll be using for my fabric, and I'm going to show you up close. It is a loosely woven cream and blush pink tweed, tweed? No, boucle, kind of. It's like a flat boucle. 
So I also got this at SR Harris, and this was on, like, they had, like, a sale table, which was really a fabric frenzy, of cut yardage. I'm not even sure. I have, like, two or three yards of this. It was for a ridiculous price. But it's um, pink and cream woven together, so it kind of gives, like, a light pink look. It is a cotton and polyester blend, I believe. I did a burn test on it, and I think the cream parts are cotton, and I think the pink um because it's a little bit shinier um is has some poly in it or some acrylic or nylon in it because it was hardening a little bit so um i would say it's mostly natural fiber but there is a little bit of polyester because i was getting a little bit of the hard um melted feeling when i did the burn test on this but it feels fantastic and it's going to move fantastic now this is a little bit thicker because it's a brocade you know it's woven but because it is so loosely woven, and you can already see, like, how bad this is fraying, and I haven't even, like, touched it yet, uh, I would have an issue with my seams fraying horribly on this if I left it as is. Now, with the weight of this would probably allow me to leave it as is, but I'm going to fuse interfacing to the back of all of my pieces for fraying purposes. That glue on the back of the interfacing is going to help keep the things in my seam allowances um, from from fraying too badly because I'm not going to finish any of my seams because it's a line jacket um, and you're going to be cutting into seams and stuff like that for um, shaping for the bust and that kind of, of thing. So you aren't going to be finishing seams off in this jacket. So yes, I would definitely recommend um, if you're using something with a looser weave that's like fraying horribly, that, um, sorry, I need to get my bangs straight, I'm <laughs> keep doing this, um, definitely fusible interfacing on the back of that is going to help that prevent that from, um, you losing your seam allowance over wear and wear and wear. Okay, so there is that. This is going to be, this is the winter fabric, woo, and I actually don't have my buttons picked out for this yet. Um, this pattern does call for one, one and one eighth button for the front, and then six seven eighth buttons, which seems a little big. A seven eighth button, seven eighths of an inch button for your um, sleeve sounds big to me. But that's what they ask. Yeah, six seven eighth inch buttons. That just seems like big. I will probably do a five eighth inch button <laughs> right here. I like the bigger button on the front because it's just one. Like a one and a one eighth is what it calls for. Just something around there. You can make your buttonhole as big as you want. Um, but I think I'm going to do smaller ones that match on my sleeves, probably five-eighths button, maybe three-quarter, depending on what I choose. And I think I'm going to do a cream, like a cream button I'm feeling. I just haven't picked them out yet. So that's what I'm using. Okay, let's talk about interfacing, and then we're going to talk about lining. Okay, not all interfacing is created equal. It makes a world of difference if you use high-quality interfacing. Now, Joann's has definitely upped their game, or I say Pellon, has that definitely upped their game. I am able to find some good Pellons at Joann in a pinch. They actually have some weft, and I'm going to show you what that looks like here in just a second. Um, some weft interfacing there that I found. Their lightweight knit fusible interfacing I will use in a pinch. Um, and then their, uh, it looks like cotton on one side and it's got glue on the back. I will use that occasionally for shirts, although I can find, you know, if I have the foresight I only use that if I am completely out of the stash that I keep at my house <laughs> um, of those interfacings. If I just don't have time to order something or I'm just being impatient and don't want to order, um, I will resort to Joann's. But high quality interfacing makes the world of difference. Now, I buy, in the past, have bought most of my interfacing from Fashion Sewing Supply. And I will leave a link to all that below and to the three main interfacings that I use from them. Um, again, the shirt crisp um, interfacing I'm not going to be using on this project, but I do use that for especially men's button-down shirts or even just regular cotton button-down shirts for me. Now, what I will be using on this project is a lightweight um, sheer, which I guess this is, sorry, I'm using this interfacing for the first time and I'll talk about it here in just a second. But I'll use a knit trico or just something sheer, um, again, to block fuse all of my pieces just to give it a little more body and to keep it from fraying horribly. And then I'm going to use a heavy duty tailoring weft um, interfacing for the tailoring pieces. So again, I haven't looked at this pattern completely, but a lot of times it's the facings that they want, anything they ask me to interface. 
Um, the pocket flaps, I'm sure, will be interfaced. My facing will be interfaced. Maybe even the whole front part of the jacket might be interfaced. Um, definitely the facing and the front piece. I don't know about if they'll have me interface the side pieces or not. Um, but yeah, definitely the front and the side. That'll all I will do with the heavier duty weft. Okay, so again, I have bought from uh, Fashion Sewing Supply forever. They've got great stuff. But for this time, I'm going to use something a little different. Um, I have a friend that sells the Palmer Pletch. Um, she's a Palmer Pletch uh, official fitter. So she's certified by Palmer Pledge to do the tissue fitting and she carries a lot of their um, product and she was going on and on about their interfacing and how wonderful it is and what I really love and fashion sewing supply is the same way is this is 60 inch wide interfacing you can't find that at Joann's everything's like 20 inches or 23 inches so I have bought some of this Palmer Pledge and I'm gonna put um, down below and I've heard great things about it from other people too but I'm very excited to try this so I have the Perfect Fuse Sheer here, um, and this is ideal for silky weight, silky blouse weights and cotton shirtings as well as knits, um, but this is the lightweight stuff. So this is what I'm going to use to block fuse my pattern pieces. Let me pull some of this out and show you. That's folded. Okay. So another thing to note is that you want a woven interfacing or like a weft. Um, you don't want any of the stuff that just kind of looks like paper that looks like it's just been kind of melded. So see how lightweight that is? It's nice. It's not going to change the hand of the fabric very much, but it's going to give it the a little bit of structure that it needs. And yeah, this is going to be perfect for block fusing. I bought a three yard pack of this. Um, that is the thing about this Palmer Pletch. You buy it in packs. You don't buy it, um, you don't buy it by the yard. And I'm trying to see. I do not, and I don't think you need to with this one either. I never pre-treat my interfacing. High quality interfacing does not need to be pre-shrunk. The high quality stuff, as long as you follow the directions, so as long as you hold your iron down, and I literally do. I will watch the clock. You know, if it says hold it for 15 seconds, um, you know, I'll be careful. You know, do like maybe an indiscreet spot first to make sure I'm not scorching anything. But I will hold for the count, the 15 seconds. Pick up, press. Do all of that, you know, f fix your, your pieces, and then let it cool for a minute. Now, a lot of times I will carefully pick it up off the board and set it down, but you've got to let that glue set. If you don't let that glue set, if you immediately start manipulating it and working with it, the glue hasn't had time to set and you're going to get the bubbling. That's what causes the bubbling. You've not properly fused and allowed it to cure. Um, so that's my, you know, a lot of times I will even fuse pieces, cut them out, fuse them, and let them sit overnight. Um, now, if I'm in a big hurry, you know, I at least give them, I don't know, 20 to 30 minutes to make sure they're cool and back to room temperature before I start messing with them because you really want that um, glue to adhere and to make it be bond and to become one. So that is these high quality interfacings, you don't have to pre-shrink. That is, the bubbling is not caused by that. The bubbling is caused by the glue not adhering, perf not adhering well, which could be just a poor quality interfacing or it could be that just that you rushed and you didn't, you know, hold it down as much as you were supposed to. It's a very, it's a test in patience. <laughs> and then let it cure. Let it completely bond and cool. So that is that one. So that's what I will use for the entire body of the jacket. Put this back in here. I think I got three yards of this for like 20 bucks, which it can be pricey because um, I'll use a large majority of that, but again, it's 60 inches wide, so that's quite a bit. Um, and I think, actually, the pattern only calls for, well, this is just regular interfacing, calls for two and three quarter yards, but that is a 20 inch interfacing, so I'll be able, this will go a lot farther. So this is the heavier weight stuff, this is the tailoring weft, and this is Perfect Fuse Medium. Okay, this is what I use for my heavier duty tailoring applications. Can you see? 
This is weft interfacing. Technically the other stuff is too. This is what I'm going to use to fuse to my um, um, fronts, my, in my facings, my well pockets. This will be what I'm going to be using for my tailoring. Again, oh, you wanted to move over there. Um, this stuff is fantastic and it's what I recommend all the time. So anyway, that is it for, oh, lining. My favorite linings. Hold on one second. Okay, linings. <laughs> My favorite lining to use on pretty much any kind of jacket, um, like a blazer type jacket, and coats actually too. Bimberg, rayon. I love rayon Bimberg lining is my absolute favorite because it is slippery and um, and it breathes. If you're using a natural fiber, which again, there's a little polyester in mine, but it's cotton mostly, um, you want to be able to retain the, um, because even my interfacing has quite a bit of rayon in it, you want to be able to retain those pro those properties of that fabric that are make it wonderful. And so if you have a polyester lining or an acetate lining on the inside of a um, wool or cotton or silk jacket, because you could use a heavyweight silk if you wanted to, like a dupioni or something for this jacket, um, you lose that because it's going to make you very hot because it's not breathable. So I almost always use rayon for my linings, which is what this is. Bimberg rayon is my favorite. Um, I'm going to put a link down below where I get my Bimberg. It's fantastic stuff. Um, you could use you know, a, a fun polyester. Make sure it's slippery. A lot of times with coats, you can get away with doing something that's a little less slippery on the body, just making sure you have slippery fabric in the sleeves. For blazers, I like to do slippery all over. And you can find some rayon linings that are printed that are beautiful. Um, I haven't really looked for any recently, but they are out there. Uh, it just may be easier just to do for a blazer, just a solid color, and I will probably use this gray if I have enough. If I don't, I'll order some more. Um, but again, link to that in below. But I find, um, yeah, with coats, because they're so oversized, you know, a coat, because you have to wear it over so many layers, that you can get away with just having the slippery in your arms. But since blazers are more fitted, I find I have a hard time doing this if I don't have the slippery in the back, too. So I prefer a good rayon lining for my coats. But again, you could use a slippery, you could use the acetate, you could use... Um, a polyester that's if you wanted to print something that's got um, just make sure it's slippery you don't want anything that's going to stick so even if it's a polyester you want maybe like a satin finish on one side um so that you can move in it so that is my big recommendation so that is your lining so i think that kind of wraps up all of the notions that we're going to need so yes your homework <laughs> Um, go ahead and get all your stuff cut out. So when I see you next time, I'm going to have everything cut out and I will have all of my pieces fused to the lighter weight interfacing. Um, and I will also have my tailoring interface fused, but I will talk about that as we go, um, move forward. So I kind of explain where I'm interfacing, why, and that kind of stuff. I'll just, we'll have it done next time I see you. Um, and then we will start sewing. And again, I will have some little mini tutorials coming up on Fridays to kind of back up what we're going to be doing on the sew along. So again, we're a very tutorial sew along heavy in March. Um, and I hope that's okay. And we'll get to some other stuff. I have a lot of fun stuff planned for, um, further into the year as we get into April and stuff. So again, don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, because we've got a lot of fun stuff coming up. And sorry, this was a long video, but I wanted to kind of go through all this with you guys and we will start sewing next Tuesday. Um, Friday, we'll have, I will have a um, tutorial on my industrial sewing machine because I will be doing all of my sewing except for my buttonholes on my industrial machine. So I'm gonna kind of show you around that and what you'll be seeing and how I work that and that kind of thing for Friday. So I will see you again next Tuesday and we will start sewing and making up this jacket. I hope you guys have a wonderful week and I will see you on Friday. Bye.